coming up on Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. We're talking about matter in extreme conditions with Bob Nagler from SLAC National Accelerator Laboratory. That's up next on Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Dr. Kiki's Science Hour is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Dr. Kiki Science Hour with me, Dr. Kiki, episode 133, recorded Thursday, February 16th, 2012. Extreme Matters. This episode of Dr. Kiki's Science Hour is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All streamed directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twit. Welcome, everyone, to Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. I'm Dr. Kiki, and yes, this is the show where you get to spend an entire hour digging into some subject usually of my choosing, in the sciences with a single expert in that topic. Whole hour with one expert. How often do you get that in your life unless you're at college or something, right? Not everybody is in college. So I am so happy to bring you this resource of information. And today I hope you are ready to just dig into a really fascinating subject because we are going to get dirty. We're going to get hot. Well, extremely hot like two million degrees hot. We're talking about matter in extreme conditions with Bob Nagler from SLAC National Accelerator Laboratory today. So I hope that you are, are waiting for it, just excited, because you know what? It's time for some science headlines first. It's February 16th, 2012, and this is the science that made headlines this week. The presidential budget request for fiscal year 2013 was released. It reduces funding to NASA, bringing the total to 117.7 billion. Funding for commercial space flight was increased, but the budget for planetary exploration was slashed, leaving Mars missions in trouble. However, even though NASA didn't get all that was hoped, Overall funding for non-defense research and development uh, overall and development was pushed by 5%, pushing it up to 64.9 billion. A team from the Imperial College London reported on an analysis of Martian soil from the 2008 Phoenix mission. According to the research letter, Mars has been arid far too long, over 600 million years, and had too much of a short wet period, or much too short of a wet period, at most 5,000 years, for microbial life to gain traction. They suggest that future missions must plan to dig deeper for signs of life on the red planet. UCLA researchers found that breast cancer radiation treatment transforms cancer cells it doesn't kill into treatment-resistant induced breast cancer stem cells, or IBCSCs. Interestingly, the radiation stimulates the same programming pathways in the cancer cells as are used to reprogram normal cells into induced pluripotent stem cells in the laboratory. The team also found that the ability of the IBCSCs to form tumors was increased 30 times that of non-irradiated breast cancer cells. A review of 33 studies involving 1,700 heart attack patients was published in the Cochrane, Cochrane Laboratory, Library, excuse me, and found that patients treated with stem cells in addition to angioplasty recovered better than those who weren't given the controversial little cells. The world's smallest chameleon was discovered on the island of Nozi Hara in northern Madagascar. Called Brachysia micra, the mini chameleons measure in at under an inch and can sit on the tip of a matchstick. Their size is thought to be due to a phenomenon known as island dwarfism. The oldest animal on Earth was found by researchers at the University of St. Andrews. Otavia antica, a microscopic sponge-like organism, was discovered in 760 million year old African rocks in Namibia. It predates the previous ancestor to all of life by approximately 100 million years. 
A paper in the Royal Society Journal Biology Letters describes the annual migration of the northern wheat ear, a tiny songbird who travels up to 9,000 miles to Africa from Canada. The scientists used minute tagging devices that did not add considerably to the bird's 25-gram weight. Scientists from Shanghai's University of Science and Technology publishing in Nature Photonics detailed their accomplishment of entangling eight photons, something known as a Schrodinger cat state. The researchers used ultra-bright photon sources to control for problematic factors. The research will contribute to future quantum computing and quantum simulations of condensed matter physics. Physicists at the Large Hadron Collider released the schedule for 2012. It includes a tripling in the total number of particle collisions, which will be achieved via upping the power of each beam from 3.5 tera electron volts to 4.0 tera electron volts, which is an increase of 15 percent, and by gradually stepping up the number of protons circumnavigating the collider. An analysis by BYU researchers of 1,724 primary and secondary school students found a strong relationship between sleep and performance on standardized tests. The optimum amount of sleep decreases with age from 9 to 9.5 hours for 10-year-olds to 7 hours for 16-year-olds. I don't want to know what that suggests for somebody my age. And British researchers published the ponytail shape equation in physical review letters. Yep, when used in combination with the Rapunzel number, I'm not making this up, people. The equation can predict the shape of a ponytail. In addition to helping scientists understand and develop fibrous materials, it could lead to an improved sequel to the movie Tangled. And that does it for the science news headlines this week. Let me know what you think about these science news stories or suggest some stories for next week by emailing me at drkiki at drkiki.tv or you can send me a voicemail. Leave me a voicemail. 650-741-5454 is the number. And now for a word from our sponsor. This episode of Dr. Kiki Science Hour is brought to you by Netflix. Netflix streams thousands of TV episodes and movies directly to you instantly, saving you time, money, and hassle. And we know how nice the savings there can be. There are several easy ways to instantly access your TV episodes that you love to enjoy and TV shows with Netflix. You can watch Netflix movies and shows on your Mac, your PC, iPad, iPhone, and even some Android devices. You can uh, also watch if you have a gaming console, like an Xbox 360 or a PS3 or a Nintendo Wii. Additionally, set-top boxes, which are cheap and pretty easy to use, like the Apple TV or the Roku box, are additional ways that you can access Netflix. With Netflix, you can watch movies and TV shows instantly using any of these devices, and you can start watching on any, any one of the devices, and if something interrupts you, you can stop and then pick it up later on the same device or a different device at the, sa at the exact spot where you left off. It's really convenient. Whichever way you choose to access Netflix, you can watch as many movies and TV shows as you want any time you want, and you can cancel at any time. So, try now a free 30-day trial with Netflix. That's right. Try Netflix today, 30 days for free. Go to netflix.com slash twit. And be, be sure to use this URL when you sign up. Otherwise, you won't get the free 30-day trial. It's netflix.com slash twit. We thank Netflix for their support of twit, and we hope that you enjoy watching instantly with Netflix. All right, time to get into our science discussion of the week. I've been jabbering on long enough. Our guest today is Bob Nagler. He has a background in high power physics and fast X-ray physics with research experience both at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory and Oxford University. His own research in interests are situated in the high energy density phys physics and warm dense matter sciences, but he's currently working on matter at extremes in the LINAC Coherent Light Source, LCLS, at SLAC National Accelerator Laboratory. Bob, thank you so much for joining me on the show. Thank you for inviting me. You're welcome, and I'm very excited you're here in person. Normally I talk with people over Skype and so I'm this is 
it right there. It's very strange. Well, Slack is very close to Petaluma, so it was easy to come over. Yeah, that's, and I think that's... Uh, it's, it's one of the things that people might not realize. All around the nation, there are national laboratories that are just kind of in your backyard here and there, scattered, scattered around. And uh, it's, there is amazing science happening at these places. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Just, just amazing. I read stuff coming out of these places. Just, just incredible. And what led me to getting, getting you here on the show today is a press release that I saw about a paper that uh, was published announcing uh, that you had brought matter at the LCLS MEC, Matter at Extreme Conditions, uh, experiment to over 2 million degrees. And it just, or, or it, it just seems crazy. Two million degrees is, is hotter than the surface of the sun. Is it? It is, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's quite a bit hotter. Actually. It's quite a bit hotter. How, how, why, what did you do? Can you, can you summarize the, the study itself? Yeah, so what we basically did is we took a very bright source of x-rays, one that is generated by the linear coherent light source you mentioned, and focused, focused it in a very tiny spot on a piece of aluminum. Mm -hmm. And that basically, in a nutshell, is, is it. Uh, if you <laughs> so high-powered x-rays. High-powered x-rays, very small spots, so all the energy is focused and concentrated. And if you do that with enough photons, you, you heat matter up uh, to 2 million degrees. How, now, how much power does it take to get high power, the, the x-rays high powered enough to actually well, get the heat that high? The total amount of energy you need is not even that extraordinarily high. It's only 3 millijoule. Hmm. Um, it's not that much. Yeah, no, it's not. But because you, all the energy is, is concentrated in a very short amount of time, 80 femtoseconds, and femtosecond is a million of a billionth of uh, a second. So it's, yeah, it's 10 very, to the very minus short. 15 or 10 to the minus 15 is a femtosecond. Yeah. So we are about 80, 80 of those. So if you concentrate all that energy, which is that much energy, in such a small time, and then focus it to a small spot, you get a very high energy density. And that's really what we need. Now, in and of itself, actually, I know 2 million sounds a lot, but yeah. with conventional lasers, this is it's fairly routine to do. You don't need such a huge uh, laser system of optical lasers to create 2 million degrees or even more. The real new thing about, about this study is that we use x-rays. And there's a lot of reasons why x-rays are, are, are very exciting to do this. Um, the, the heating mechanism is, is completely different than mm -hmm. the one when you use optical lasers. And, and x-rays are, are extremely well suited also to study the matter you create that way. Yeah, so it, what does uh, the x-ray actually do to the matter as it's heating it up? I imagine it's exciting the, the particles. Yeah, that, that's right. So what it does, it, it, it's, if you look at an atom, there, there's some electrons which are in orbit, if you want to use a classical picture of an atom, mm -hmm. uh, very close to the core of the I atom. I like to think of the atom cloud. You like to think <laughs> of the atom cloud. So the, the, <laughs> the electrons that are in, in, in the part of the cloud that's very close to the, to the core, if you wish. Okay. Um, with normal optical lasers, you can't really excite those. You don't have to the photons in your, in your laser light. They don't have enough energy to take one of those electrons and kick it all the way out of the atom. Mm -hmm. Now, if you have x-rays, every x-ray photon has much more energy than an optical photon because it's directly related to the, the frequency. So you can actually take those photons from the core and kick them all the way out. Okay, and so because you're dealing with, with x-rays as opposed to optical light, yeah. it's the, the frequency is just much higher. Correct. It's at a different, different level of the electromagnetic spe spectrum. Yes, it's a yeah. much higher energetic part of the electromagnetic spectrum with much shorter wavelengths. Mm -hmm. And what, what happened, I mean, the fundamental thing that's different is if you, if you look at the way optical light heats matter, once you start to ionize the matter and you get free electrons in it, mm -hmm. the optical light can't really penetrate anymore through the, through the matter because it gets reflected by the, by the free electrons mm. in, in the material. It's basically the, the way a mirror works. Right. In, in a metal, there's free electrons. Your optical light hits those free electrons and gets reflected. Now. If you then want to heat a solid piece of material, 
it's kind of hard to do that in bulk because all the energy gets deposited in those very first layers of the material and deeper inside you don't really get your laser light indirectly. Right. So you end up with a very hot surface layer and then the rest is cold and the heat gets transferred either by conduction, conduction or, convection yeah. or, or radiation. It, mm -hmm. it really depends, it's, it's a complicated mechanism and it really depends on, on the temperature you reach in that initial layer. But the problem is whatever you do, you typically end up with large temperature gradients in your, in your bulk material. Mm -hmm. And the matter we're studying is already very hard to study if you know exactly which temperature you have and if it's one temperature. If you now get this range of temperatures the, and these large gradients, it becomes even an order of magnitude or more, more, more difficult to study. Mm -hmm. So X-rays, they have the advantage that their, their frequency is so so large and that means that they can actually penetrate through the material. So an X-ray would actually go straight through a mirror. It doesn't get, get reflected. Okay. So your X-rays don't only heat the front surface of your matter, but they kind of can heat it in bulk. So the, the whole piece of material, which you know, was only four microns, uh, our samples were only four microns thick, so they weren't even you know, Tiny. when I talk about bulk, you might think <laughs> of you know, centimeters of material. No, it's only yeah. four microns. But still, that's a huge difference with samples that are usually used when optical lasers are taken. And we're talking about nanometers or hundreds of nanometers. And is this, is this just because at the, uh, the level of the research at this point, it's, it's just technologically not possible to look at larger quantities? Or it's just you don't, don't really have any reason to? Well, um, you, the reason is, is really also that even in four microns, although x-rays, they go through the material, they still get absorbed. Mm -hmm. So if you make it too long, you would still get, get a temperature gradient. So there mm -hmm. is it's kind of a trade-off. If, if you have more material there, your diagnostic becomes slightly easier. You have more, more counts on your detectors. You'll mm -hmm. have um, you know, less noise on your, on your signals. Right. But of course, your data becomes more difficult to interpret because you know now that you'll have these these temperature gradients. Yeah, in I get. Sample. I guess where like where where I'm coming from is in like the popular culture uh, idea of sh shooting a, an X-ray at an at an object. You know, you, I, I think of cartoons where you have mm -hmm. some guy who has an X-ray gun and he shoots at a, a metal door and the the door disappears and <laughs> then they're able to run through to the next the next chamber in the scene and catch the bad guy and Scooby-Doo gets a Scooby snack, you know. Yeah. <laughs> that's not, that's not where, this is, where this is going at this point. No, not, not particularly. <laughs> no. Um, no, that's, I mean, if you, if you really want to penetrate even more deep in, in mm -hmm. material than, than, let's say, microns, tens of microns, you need even higher energetic mm -hmm. um, x-rays and those are not really uh, created in, in, in the LCLS where, where I work. Right. Also, I mean, if, if all your energy actually streams through the matter, it mo becomes more difficult to heat it. You, you kind of have another trade-off there. If, you, if your material is really transparent and you can penetrate very deeply, then none of the matter actually absorbs the x-rays, so mm -hmm. it doesn't heat up very much. Right. Uh, what kinds of materials are you, are you working at? Right now, just aluminum? Um, is there is there the possibility of uh, looking at metamaterials and, and matter with maybe different Yeah, I mean, what you can, there's really no limit. The reason why we used aluminum uh, was, well, there were a couple of reasons, mostly for convenience sake. It's, it's a fairly simple material in the sense of, of crystallographic structure and the, the electronic structure. Mm -hmm. um, it's got three free electrons, which sort of are in a state of a free electron gas. It's, it's easy or fairly easy to mm -hmm. understand. It's also cheap. It's uh, non-corrosive. And it's, we had experience with it on other experiments. So we, we right. the group of researchers that, that did it kind of understood it very well. And on top of that, it very well matched the, the energies of the x-rays we could use. So at that time at, the, at LCLS, the only stations that were available to do experiments could only generate, or you could only use X-rays, which are what they call fairly soft. So, so there's a soft X-ray and a hard X-ray. There's soft X-ray and hard X-ray, okay. and the boundary is not, you know, it's not a sharp boundary. But soft X-rays basically means that the the energy for each photon is 
it's less than her heart actually. So they penetrate less deeply in material um, and the, for materials like aluminum to, to get at the center, the center electrons closest to the core, mm -hmm. uh, soft x-rays will do. If you go to larger and bigger atoms like iron or, or gold, you need much more energy. You really need very hard, hard x-rays, which weren't available. So it was a kind of a combination, but uh, right now there are, since, since more than a year now, there are stations available where there have harder x-rays available. And on these, yeah, you can uh, take, pick your, your choice of sample of, uh, of material. What's the difference between uh, the x-rays that you're using and, say, the x-rays that uh, are used to check your cavities at the dentist's office? Or, you know, what's the, the level of, of scale of difference? So, um, I'm not really sure what a dentist used, to be honest. <laughs> but uh, the biggest difference... Um, so, if you characterize the x-rays, there's, there's three components. First is the amount of x-rays. Mm -hmm. and the amount of x-rays you have at LCD is, is extremely large. It's uh, 10 to the 12 photons, so that's 1 billion times 1,000, I think. Or a million times a million, right. I think, and we're at, at 12. So that, that's quite a lot. That's much more than any other source of x-rays you find, even in, in large synchrotrons, and certainly more than, I hope certainly more than what your dentist shoots to your, to your head. So, uh, there, so that's a, like a... A measure of the, the quantity or the, the quantity, yeah, the quantity yeah. of, of, of x rays. So, this three millijoule is actually quite a lot of photons. Yeah. Then they're all compressed in a very small, short amount of time. So, the pulse only lasts 80 femtoseconds. That's, I mean, you can choose actually, you can go to 300 femtoseconds or less than 10. There's, there's a bit of a, of a range you can choose, but in any case, it's very, very short. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, the the, the bandwidth, what they call the bandwidth of, of the X-rays is small. So all of these X-rays have pretty much the same frequency. And if you combine all of that, that's, there's kind of a, a number which they call the brilliance of an X-ray source. It's is quite a pretty name. Yeah. And <laughs> if you compare with, with other X-ray sources that are available in standard synchrotrons, the brilliance of, of LCLS is 10 orders of magnitude, so more than a billion times brighter than the next best thing, in a sense. Where's the next best thing? Oh, there's, there's many next best oh, okay. things. There's, these are standard <laughs> synchrotrons. There's, yeah. there's one at Slack, there's one in Berkeley. There's, right. uh, there's pretty much all over the world they build them. And they're extremely useful devices. There's very interesting physics and, and yeah. science you can do on those. But so now there's something which has 10, 10 orders of magnitude more brilliance. So you can imagine the science you can do on that. I mean, it's. People say it's, it's really going to revolutionize the field. And, and right. you know, I don't like to use words like that because they're, they're certainly overused. But in this case, I think as a source, it certainly is yes. uh, revolutionary. So how can you use the, the energy? How can you use the, the X-ray source um, to image things? What can you look at? What can you, what can you do with that, with that beam? Well, so apart from the, the stuff we, we did in our experiment and, and other, my, my own research interests, uh, one of the main drivers is to to use the X-rays to to image, for example, very very small material, microscopic and, and mm -hmm. even smaller than that. And I mean, the reason, first of all, why do you need X-rays to do that? And the reason yeah. the reason is that if you if you think of an optical microscope, you can see matter which is around a micron, a little bit a little bit less than a micron size. If you want to image things which are smaller, that's fundamentally not possible because, again, the wavelength of optical light is, is 500 nanometers, so half a micron to, to a micron, and you, you simply cannot image anything that's smaller than the wavelength of the light you use. Right. So now, if you go to smaller and smaller wavelengths, you can image smaller and smaller things. And X-rays, they're, you know, they're the ones, the, the shortest wavelengths we can access at LCLS is point one five of a nanometer, so that's it's more than a thousand times, roughly. Well, roughly a thousand times smaller than, op than optical light. Right. So you can really you can start getting into yes. really microscopic things. Really and submicroscopic. You can mm -hmm. pretty much image uh, a protein and and see where all the individual um, the units and the, subunits yes, come together, how it crosses the membrane, yeah. or yeah. 
And that, that's something actually which you can do with, with any x-rays. Mm -hmm. um, the reason why LCLS is so interesting here is because they have so many x-rays per pulse. Right. So in standard synchrotrons, if you want to image proteins or, or crystals, you need many of them and you need to kind of groove them in a crystallographic structure mm -hmm. to have enough scattering to, to, to know where all your, uh, your atoms and parts of your molecules are. At LCLS, one shot of x-rays is enough to at least image a virus which has been done. Um, and there is really hope that single, single proteins can also be imaged with a single shot. And if you can do it with a single shot, then you can actually also see how these things evolve. Because you could take, uh, you could, for example, see how they, how they react. You can look at a chemical reaction in real time. You see the molecules, you, you take a snapshot, so you fire your camera, you see where the two molecules are before the reaction, then you delay the time when, when you take a snapshot take and you see one. how it looks during and after the reaction and really follow in real time how a chemical reaction uh, works, how, how a drug kills, kills a bacteria, how yeah. You know, photosynthesis works. Yeah, and what a, one of the stumbling blo blocks for a lot of uh, our understanding of these biological uh, f processes has been the fact that to do any kind of imaging, X-ray crystallography, for instance, where we've been looking at the structure of proteins, or um, has been used to say look at this, uh, find the structure of DNA, X-ray crystallography, it you have to freeze the cell, you have to freeze yep. the protein, you damage it in the process that it, the, so that it, it, it no longer is alive or can do the process. Yep, that's right. You have to really force them into a form which you can then stick into your machine. Yeah. And I mean, these, these things have been extremely successful, but still you don't quite know if you force it in, 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 in a larger crystallographic structure, for example, how right. the, the protein itself changes. Yeah. So, you, it's right, you do damage it in a certain sense. Now, at LCLS we also damage it by the x-rays itself. Yeah, so that's we, a different sense. We, we let the, the protein, whatever you want to image, drop, we shoot our beam on it, the x-rays diffract, and after that you have destroyed your cell because the yeah. x-rays are so intense that they... But um, maybe the amount of time but it allowed a process to take place that you the beam passed through as the process was taking place well, and you got enough data. The thing is the beam is so short that the time it takes for the, the molecule to destroy is much larger than the time of the, that, that you actually take a snapshot. Mm -hmm. So during your snapshot your, your, your atom is still intact and then mm -hmm. it, it destroys. So it's kind of, they call this diffract and destroy. You first diffract, diffract and destroy. You diffract <laughs> on the target and afterward it destroys but you don't care anymore because you've got the data and you can reconstruct what the thing looked like. That's awesome. So with um, that's the the imaging side of LCLS, yep. but with um, the group you're working with, with matter at extreme conditions, what are a, in addition to X-ray beams taking matter to two million degrees? You know, what other stuff? What what kind of extremes are you talking about doing? Um, that's really, I mean, that's one of the main drivers is to to study matter when it's still solid, but but really hot. Mm -hmm. And I mean, hot can, in, in this, this, this experiment, it was two million degrees. Sometimes it's even more interesting to go to slightly lower temperatures, mm. about tens of thousands or hundred thousand uh, degrees, which is what we call warm, just to, it's just warm, it's not hot. <laughs> to physicists, just, this, yeah. is, this is warm. <laughs> exactly. And you're not, at, you're not dealing with like massive Kelvin scale numbers, mm -hmm. so yeah. And so, I mean, this, this kind of matter, you can imagine if you take a solid and you heat it up to those temperatures, it doesn't last very long. It very quickly explodes. Um, so it's very difficult to actually study in a lab mm. because it doesn't last that long, which is, again, why LCLS is so interesting, because the pulses are short enough that you can actually study the matter before it has time to, to expand. To break apart. Yeah. yeah. So in, in a lab, it's difficult to create this, but actually in the universe, uh, this matter exists fairly abundantly in every, you know, pretty much any kind of star you have this, this hot dense matter. If mm -hmm. you go a bit cooler to the warm dense matter, you find that typically at the centers of large planets, like gas giants or, or well, even, even the Earth, for example, is, um, the core of the Earth is, is fairly hot. It's about as hot as the, the surface of the sun. Mm -hmm. And there are <coughs> some theories to, it's pretty much known it's a nickel-iron core, right. and the 
pressures are, you know, they're difficult guesses in the temperature, but I mean, what the actual structure is, there's, there's still a large amount of uncertainty. Is and that something that would be able to be modeled eventually, that if you could get uh, the right amount of pressure, I mean, you probably have to take, keep pressure constant to be able to vary the temperature, but if you could actually create something to model the, the center of the Earth and actually... That's actually some experiments that, that do exactly that. Okay. So the way that is, that is done, and that has been done at conventional laser facilities too, is you take a sample of iron, you take a large laser and mm -hmm. you shoot it on a sample and it compresses and heats up to, to densities and temperatures that are close to what, uh, what we have in the center of the Earth. Right. Now then you need to study that. And again, how do you study something that's so, so dense and, and hot? And x-rays are a perfect tool because with x-rays you can get inside mm -hmm. and you can diffract on it. And since it doesn't last long, the x-rays need to be fast. You have to use time resolution, otherwise you, you, know, you integrate uh, over a time when the thing is moving and you would get a very blurry picture. Right. So with the fast x-rays you have at LCLS, you can, you can do that. And so you, you create a matter at the center of the Earth and you, you check and you see what, what crystallographic state, for example, you would have, how temperature and, and density relate to each other. Right, and, uh, and, and how uh, convection currents might, uh, might come into place. Could you, could you look at the, the, any, any aspect of the dynamics of something that would model the center of the Earth? You can, you can look at the dynamics to basically if you I mean, you know that your sample is going to expand after mm -hmm. a while, and by just detuning or timing your X-rays with respect to the, the drive poles that created the, the the dense matter, you can see how how it expands and how it how the how the what the pressure actually is. And there's other 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 diagnostics wow. that can tell you what what the pressure how how fast pressure waves uh, go in this matter. And again, that research has been done at other large large laser facilities, but with LCLS, because of the, the really high quality of the x-rays you have, it's going to be a real boon for this kind of, this kind of science. Yeah. So what kind of technology came about to be able to allow this, um, you know, this step up in power at LCLS versus other uh, synchrotron uh, sites? And, and what specifically have you, have you been putting together at, at MEC? So the specific technology to create uh, these, these bright x-rays, so this x-ray sword is called a free electron laser. And the, the way the x-rays are generated is in principle very similar to what happens on, on a standard synchrotron. So you create a, a electrons which are accelerated to uh, very high, high speeds and high energies. And then you send them to a structure which is called an undulator. And I saw a picture on the screen, so I don't know if it's, uh, it's also... Yeah, maybe under. there are some videos. Maybe okay. we, there's a, uh, a video of a, of a tour or an overview, I think. Yeah, I think I saw it on, on one of the screens here. Um, so here we have Slack. Yeah, that's Slack. So let's see if we can... This is Slack, and that was the... The that, that was the original Linac, Linac right? Yeah, Linac. and so one third of that is used for LCLS. So it, it generates uh, electrons of about 15 GV uh, for LCLS. The total Linac could actually go to 50, <coughs> but only 15 is, one third is used for, for LCLS. And okay. then just as in a, in a synchrotron, they're shot through what is called an undulator. So this is a, a, a magnetic device where you have a north-south pole point it up down and then it switches right next to it to one mm -hmm. down up and, and, and so on. And so if your electrons, I think we're going to see a picture of that now, if the electrons go through that structure, the Lorentz force actually kicks them in, in one part of the, um, no, this is not it yet. So <laughs> I'll have to wait. This is a, a chicane to really compress the Oh, well, now we don't see it anymore at all. <laughs> so basically your, your electrons, due to the Lorentz force, they kind of wiggle around. Mm -hmm. And when they wiggle in a sinusoidal pattern, they emit radiation of, of, of that same wavelength. Mm -hmm. And since they're going that, that fast, that radiation is in the X-rays. Okay. And so that's a similar principle as in a synchrotron, but because we have this, this LINAC, which has an extremely good quality of electrons that come out. 
So they're, they're very short electron bunches. They all go in the same way. They don't, uh, they have very little, little emit, what they call emittance, so they don't diverge. Mm -hmm. And the, the peak power of the X-rays that they emit is so large that it starts to uh, work back on the, on the original electron beam, which breaks up into even smaller bunches in what they call micro bunches. Mm -hmm. And these micro bunches, they, they now start to emit X-ray radiation coherently with one with respect to the other. And uh, it's perhaps a bit abstract, but for mm -hmm. those who, who know what coherence means, if you start to add up things coherently, the intensities go up dramatically. Um, and that's really how, how, you, how you get a free electron laser. So you need to have mm -hmm. a very good, high quality electron bunch. And that's really not possible to do in a, in a circular machine. You really need a linear accelerator for that. Okay. And we had this linear accelerator at Slack, which, which was available. So some clever people in the 90s thought it would be great to They looked, uh, to they looked it. ahead. They said, okay, yeah. well, the, this project is exactly. going, the, the, the linear accelerator project is going to be coming to an end. So what are we going to yeah. do after that? How can we use it? And so, so yeah, and that's a, where, what it was born from. Yeah. It's, uh, so the accelerator was not, of course, built for for LCLS, it's been around since the 60s, and mm -hmm. there's been quite a lot of elementary particle physics that has been done on it. I think there's three Nobel Prizes which were won. The, the structure, for example, of neutrons and protons, how they're built up from quarks, that was, um, mm -hmm. that was discovered at, at LCLS. It's not at LCLS. At Slack. That, with, at Slack with, with uh, the LINAC. Yeah. And um, I think the tau lepton also was, was uh, discovered here. So it's, it's, it's really been a, an extremely successful machine. Now, near the end of the 90s and in the, the new millennium, there was kind of the elementary particle physics aspect was kind of slowing down. Mm -hmm. There was still one experiment running. And some very clever people realized that actually this, this LINAC, which is still, the, I think, the largest LINAC on, on the planet, could be retooled to, to create a free electron laser. And you know, 10 years later, here it is. And it's really a missing it, device. Yeah, and it's, I, I, I keep seeing really interesting news come out of uh, come out of of the LCLS. The, your your uh, matter at extremes work, and then there's also uh, there was some other uh, atomic X-ray, the the atomic X-ray mm -hmm. laser yeah. work. Do you do you know about that? Can you talk I, about that? I do know about that. So. Um, so basically, as I said, what you can do with these X-rays, you can uh, excite or create holes very close to the core of an atom. Mm -hmm. So you can shoot the X-ray on an atom and take out the, the inner electrons. Mm -hmm. Now those holes, they don't really last very long. They, they like to get refilled by electrons, which uh, come from outer, out the outer part of the cloud, if you wish. Okay. And so if that happens, they, they re-emit sometimes, again, new X-rays which have extremely very specific, uh, very specific wavelength, which is um, dependent on the amount of energy between the different parts of the cloud. Right. And so if you, if you now have a really bright X-ray source and you create a lot of these atoms which have holes, then the first one of these X-rays that's re-emitted can, can stimulate another X-ray, just like in a, in a normal laser, stimulates uh, a recombination in, in the neighboring atom and these two stimulate even more atoms, and so you can you can build just a laser, just like an, a normal standard box standard laser, but in the X-ray regime. And that up to now was not not possible because you just can't create so many atoms with so many holes in the inner in the inner shells. Right, but now with the with uh, LCLS, it was possible. It was possible, yeah. Because you're just upping the upping exactly. the, the quantity of the yeah. X-rays that are there. So you get you. So what could it, uh, and and what can you do with this X-ray atomic X-ray laser now that could not be done with an optical laser? Or are there? I mean, for now, there? it's it's mostly it's mostly I would say still fundamental research, mm -hmm. and nobody has um, used the the laser light of that X-ray laser created by LCLS to do any any experiments, and I, it's probably going to be a while yet. Mm -hmm. Um, first of all, because I mean, you already have a, a pretty good kind of extra laser LCLS itself, which is there. Yeah. There are some advantages by with, with the optical one in the sense that it's, it's a very nar much narrower um, bandwidth and, mm -hmm. and, and pulses are really short. 
but uh, for now it's mostly to to study how the stimulated emission works in these inner shells, what time scales are, what kind of um, light comes out. I mean, what right. Very basic, very thing. basic it's, it's very research. very basic atomic physics. One of the, this was done yeah. at one of the end stations where they do atomic and molecular optics, which was pretty much designed to do, to do these things. Look at what happens to the atomic physics at these inner shell uh, electrons when you create these inner shell holes. Someday I will have my atomic x-ray gun, <laughs> just like in the, in the cartoons. How did you get involved in, in this area of physics and end up at, um, at SLAC? You're uh, being Dutch. It's not, you know, it's... Uh, it's Belgian. A, it's Belgian, sorry. Mm, <gasps> Got it. You, men you mentioned it. I speak Dutch, but it's, I'm from Belgium. Oh, it's okay. sorry. Uh, I lose forgiven. points. That's okay. Um, I, I, I ended up in this field when I... When I went to Oxford, so after I, I finished a postdoc at, at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, I, I went back to, to Oxford for about two and a half years uh, for a postdoc. And the group I worked in there um, was uh, the Oxford, was led by Justin Warwick. They do high power, I think they're called high power laser group. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so they, they typically use high power lasers to create, again, this, this matter, this either matter under very high pressures and look at phase transitions in, for example, iron, the, the thing I mentioned. Um, but they're also interested in, in just warm dense matter or hot dense matter created by other means. And at exactly the time, it was almost coincidental, that I, that I went there, there was another free electron laser in Hamburg, which was coming uh, online and operational. Now, it's not a free electron laser that goes all the way to the x-rays. It stops at the boundary between really deep UV light and X-ray light, mm -hmm. so soft X-rays, but still for, for this kind of research it's, it's extremely useful to already have access to those wavelengths. So there were a number of experiments which were ongoing, again these are collaborations between many many teams yeah. of, uh, of, of all different, different places, and so since I was in Oxford I, I got involved in this experiment and we started doing experiments there. And so that's how I got involved and excited about this field. And then when LCLS came, came online, where they even pushed the, the photon energy boundary to higher levels, uh, I thought this was a place to go. You said, this is where I want to be. Yeah. Just, I want to be where they're pushing boundaries. At, at this time, uh, it's a, a really exciting place to be. So when you're, when you're dealing with matter, um, are you dealing with... Is it, is it it's physics? Is it chemistry? Is it what kind of, of uh, questions? How, how do you form your questions? What, what background do you come from? Well, the questions we... One of the questions, for example, we really want to answer, and I would say it's physics, mm -hmm. the, the, the matter under extreme conditions uh, field, if you wish. It's, it's more physics than, than chemistry. Mm -hmm. The que one of the questions we want to answer is, for example, how does temperature, pressure, and density relate to each other? And, and that's a, a very fundamental, fundamental question. Mm -hmm. I mean, in, in gases, pretty the much The ideal every, gas I, law, right? PV go. equals NRT. Ex exactly. I'm so never going to forget it. For, <laughs> that's, everybody in high school knows that. And yeah. in a gas, especially an ideal gas, it's, it's extremely simple. Yeah. When, when you go to a liquid and a solid, it becomes slightly more complicated, but still it's, it's known. Now for these really hot dense materials and warm dense materials, especially the warm dense materials, it is not known. Okay. And so if you have these people who really want to model how the interior of, of a planet works, how, what the temperature and density of the interior of the sun even is, mm -hmm. they really need to know these values. And so right now yeah. they use values, but they have not really been checked. There's many floating around which are are different and so it would really help if they can be measured in, in a lab. And you, once again warm dense like the center of the earth versus yes. hot dense like the center of the sun. The center of the sun that would be very hot and, and dense and very dense. <laughs> warm and, not like a nice spring yeah. day. <laughs> and so warm warm and dense would be more like between 10,000 and, and 100,000 Kelvin. Okay. Um, and still all at solid, solid uh, densities. So. Okay and um, are you specifically interested in the the solids? As a, well, you're talking a lot about getting a get 
watching the this matter at the very high temperatures or at high pressures um, before it breaks apart, before it changes. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're taking a solid at two million degrees, it's turning into a plasma. So that's a change of state there. But are you, um, is it, are you looking at all aspects of just the change in phases? You, you do look at a change when, I mean, a lot of, when you create these, these, these warm materials, a lot of things happen. I mean, yeah. initially when you, when you have your cold solid, you heat a matter up with your x-rays, or even if you do it with an optical laser, all the energy you, you dump into the system goes first into the electrons. Mm -hmm. So they heat up to two million degrees or, or, or whatever, but your, your atoms, your atomic cores, they actually stay, stay cold. Mm -hmm. So you have this, this system where there's not really one temperature you can even define. The electrons are very fast, very hot, but your atoms are cold. Then on, on a slightly longer time scale, the electrons start giving their energy to the, to the atoms. And again, that time scale is, at these temperatures is not really known. It's one of the things we also want to find out. Right. And once that happens, the, in a lab at least, where there's no, no confinement due to gravity, which you would have, of course, in a star, mm -hmm. the, the matter will start to expand. And how fast it expands will depend on the pressure. Right. And so actually by looking how fast it expands, we can determine the pressure. Hmm. The density we'll know because we use a solid sample, we know what the density of aluminum is. Right. But the, and the pressure you could, you could measure by looking, seeing how it, how it expands. It's actually another experiment which has uh, taken place since, uh, since then. The data is not yet analyzed Still working by, on it. Uh, by a group, mainly driven by a group in France who came to LCLS to uh, do the experiment. And then, yeah, there's, there's also ways to, to get the temperature so we can get these three variables and, and figure out how it works. So we, we, are, we are interested in seeing how the sample evolved. Now, once it gets really dilute, really turns into a, a thin plasma with the density of a gas, it's less interesting just because it's, it's very well known how, how such systems behave. Those work. Yeah. That's well studied because... It is. I mean, there's still certain things which are not known. For example, mm -hmm. if you create a lot of, in such a plasma, a lot of, again, atoms with, like with holes. Like in Tokamaks. <laughs> yeah, so the, the plasma in Tokamaks, it's, I think it's, I'm, I'm not at all an expert. It's, it, somebody might give a comment on your blog that I'm, I'm <laughs> yeah. spewing nonsense here. But the, the plasma itself is fairly well, well understood. Mm -hmm. uh, there are still uncertainties if you create a lot of core holes in these um, in these atoms, typically, you, you don't typically have an atom where you have a lot of electrons still bounding the outer shells, but the inner shells are empty, because how would you, I mean, that's, that's a non-stable system. Right. You can only create that with, really, with x-rays at LCLS. And so all the rates, how these things go back to an equilibrium are, are not necessarily uh, very accurately known. But for the rest, in, in a standard plasma, yeah, the, it's, there's much less uncertainty. Also because the probes that are used to study that can be conventional lasers because mm -hmm. if, it's, if it's dilute enough, your laser light can penetrate in it, it and you have uh, all your, your laser probes which have been available for the last 20, 30 years and which, have, uh, which you can't use for the denser stuff. For your interest in, in the pushing the boundaries of, uh, of high energy physics and matter, physics. Um, are you interested in um, application or are you interested in just scientific inquiry and finding out more about how things are put together and how they, how they work? I'm, I think I'm more interested in, in the, the scientific um, you know, curiosity and mm -hmm. basic science. I mean, there's, I, there's very little real applications of of this in a sense. I mean, it feeds back into a lot of planetary science and, and, and stellar science. So if you want, you can use, call that an application. Mm -hmm. um, the real, the one big application is, is in inertial confinement fusion. So there's, right. this is not done at all at, at SLAG, but they're in Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. There's a huge project. I've been to the National Ignition okay. Facility a couple yeah. of times, and it's, that's it's a, amazing. It's a pretty amazing, amazing But facility. they're using optical laser light. They're using optical laser light uh, to, to really create uh, a sample, which hopefully will, 
will, will fuse and, and create energy, yes. And fingers crossed that we will hear about that this year. Yep. The, I am uh, so excited. It's, uh, <laughs> this year is the, the year it should happen, yeah. Yeah. But so, um, yeah, the states that they, so they start again there, they start with a, with a cold pellet of, of, I think it's mostly hydrogen and some deuterium they use, and then they, they want to compress it and, and, and fuse the material in, inside. So they compress it, make it even more dense, they heat it up. So you go through from a cold solid through this warm dense state, through a hot dense state, before you get to a point where you could fuse. Mm -hmm. So really knowing how your material behaves in this warm dense and uh, these hot dense states right, is really important to, to, to carefully design your experiment and, and get the most out of your fusion. And, and especially uh, when you've got such a, a small sensitive sample that you're, that you're dealing with, you want to make sure that there aren't any instabilities at any point exactly. leading up to the fusion yeah. process because you don't want the whole thing just to you know, putz out yeah. before you get there. Exactly, and so yeah. knowing the thermodynamical variables and how they relate to each other is, is really important and that's something you do, you can study at, at mm. LCLS, at yeah. NEC. Yeah, so, so understanding the basics leads to application, but sometimes there's just a, just, just a joy in the just mm -hmm. finding things out, yeah. figuring out how it all works. It's just great. How is it to work at LCL, LCLS? Oh, it's just really great. It's, um, it's a really extremely diverse diverse facility of scientists from completely different backgrounds interested in in very different um, physics or, or chemistry or mm -hmm. biology or all there to do experiments and it's it's also it's a user facility it's not the the little tinker toy of, of scientists at slack it's basically the whole world who can use it if you if you have a good idea that needs very high brightness x-rays you can write a proposal send it in it will get reviewed by a review panel, and if it's found good enough, then mm -hmm. you can come over and, and do your experiments. And part of what you do is helping groups, international groups, yeah. find time and interface and work with Yes, the, so with we, we make sure that the people who have the, the good ideas and who get beam time to do their experiment, yeah. that their experiment works and that everything gets in order. Make and we sure, you, you make sure they have a good idea, number one. Yeah. <laughs> Not just anybody can come up with an idea. No, it's it's because it's such a unique source. It's extremely oversubscribed. It's I bet only I think it's 25 or less than. I have to look at the recent numbers, but it's less than 25 percent of the proposals that actually get a lot of beam time. Is there is there is when you look at the schedule, say for 2012, it's just is it full up until 2015? Or are there just so many projects that it's. No, so what the way the scheduling works is every every six months, so twice a year, there's a call for proposals, mm. and people submit proposals. They're being judged, and then they're the ones who make the cut. They've been they scheduled for the next or six months later. Okay. So typically, when you when you submit a proposal, if you're lucky, about nine months to a year later, you your experiment will be. So and it's not like so waiting I mean, to launch a space telescope no. or something. <laughs> and if you're not successful, then you can either write another proposal or improve mm -hmm. your proposal and, and resubmit it. So right now, everything is actually scheduled until the end of this year, the end of 2012. But nothing yet for 2013, so it's still completely open and everybody with a good idea can, can submit something and, and get beam time. That's pretty cool. For people who might be interested in a career like yours, where you're working in, at a national accelerator lab and you're doing this high energy physics and matter at extreme conditions. I mean, these, these titles are kind of sensational, even though they're, they just explain what it is. <laughs> it's very exciting. How, how does somebody who might get interested in something like that get to follow a path like, like yours, get to work at some place like LCLS? Well, I mean, first thing is to get interested in when you're in, in university, I guess. And, mm -hmm. and I mean, in my case, it, this would be, you would have to do physics or well, actually my, I, I, to be honest, it's difficult to say because my background has been engineering. I, I did engineering as an undergraduate. And then oh, okay. when I did um, my PhD, I got more into more into physics. So I've kind of wondered about um, different different scientific disciplines and ended up here so I, I 
I find it hard to really give advice if you want to end up here, do this because right. well, there's so many might, different paths might, to exactly. Possibly. You might and thinking you're going one way and end up somewhere completely different, which you hadn't even foreseen, like I did. But otherwise, yeah, I'm trying to find a, a project for for a PhD that's that's in this field. There's many universities which have uh, people who work on this, so it mm -hmm. should not be too too hard to find. Yeah, if a, I always uh, learning by experience, I think is always one of the yeah. the best possible ways to get involved in stuff like this. Hands on, try and get a job in a lab. Yeah. Intern. <laughs> oh yeah. Get yourself in there. We are coming to the end of the hour. I am. Uh, this has been so much, so interesting, and I'm just fascinating, uh, fascinated by what what physicists like you are doing at Slack and what uh, the, the many projects that are going on there and matter in extreme conditions. I am looking forward to hearing hearing more from you in the future. We'll keep you informed. Excellent, excellent, and I hope. Hope that we can come visit. I would love you're, that. You're always welcome. Just tell us when, and uh... that would be so great. You hear that, everybody? Maybe Dr. Kiki will make a visit to Slack and take some cameras. Possibly. Yeah. That'd be cool. Take that would tour. be very cool. It would be very cool. Leo, you hear that? <laughs> <laughs> we would definitely. I definitely want to try and make that happen because, like you said, it was easy for you to get up here, and so it should be easy to come the other way. It should be easy to go the other direction. Great, I love this idea. But everybody, if you are interested in more information about matter and extreme conditions or what's going on at Slack National Accelerator Laboratory, you can visit um, Slack's website. Now, uh, they have a very long web address to actually get to, so I made a bit.ly address, uh, bit.ly.com slash slackmech. <laughs> I hope that great. I hope that will get I'm gonna you. use it from now on. <laughs> Bitly.com slash slack mech. Hopefully that will get you to the information that um, that you're looking for. Bob Nagler, thank you very much for joining us here today. Thank you for inviting me. You're welcome. And everybody that does it for Dr. Kiki's Science Hour today, I'm Dr. Kiki and I do hope that you enjoyed the show today. I hope you learned something. Next week we'll be talking about something sciencey. I'm still trying to get our guest confirmed. Fortunately, it seems to be like pulling teeth this week. Some weeks are really easy. Some weeks are not so easy. I don't know. We're working on it. Anyway, until next week, you can follow my sciencey pursuits on the internets. I am Dr. Kiki on Twitter, Dr. Kiki on Facebook, Kiki Sanford on Google+. I have drkiki.tv as my website, and you can email me at drkiki at drkiki.tv. Additionally, um, if you want more episodes of this program, if you need more Dr. Kiki Science Hour in your life, just head on over to twit.tv slash kiki for past episodes. It'll be very easy for you to download or to stream stuff from there. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. I really appreciate your time. And do remember that all I ask is one hour a week to make your world a whole lot more interesting. Thank you so much. Now it's time for the science meditation of the week. Multiple vehicles can fly as a formation. We developed a method to transition between formations in 3D. The team can also navigate in environments with obstacles. <laughs>